Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the teaching and learning call the, uh, on Wednesday, February 21st, 2018. My name is Tricia Gordon, and I am your facilitator today from the University of Virginia. And we're very excited to have folks from Duke and Marist today um, who will be talking about going local with global innovations um, with the Atlas uh, program. But before we begin that presentation, uh, do we have any announcements? We, we could. <laughs> would, would you I like some? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm uh, double checking on this just with the Sakai Dev Slack channel, but um, was going to send out an announcement to the community. Uh, today we didn't make we did not make our February twentieth RCO three date. I'm hoping we'll make it um, next. Uh, ne you know, next week we um, the the main things out there. There's some assignments blocker uh, issues, and there's um, the help documentation. Um, I may may have mentioned this before that we're still using Screen Steps, which is a commercial product, and they used to provide an HTML output, so it made it relatively easy for. Uh, um, there to be a script that could move that into Sakai, the HTML, but uh, ScreenSteps got rid of that. So Longsight is working on using the ScreenSteps APIs to get the help documentation out. So those are the two big things that we have um, before we can make uh, a little more progress there. So that's that's one thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but I was going to send something out to the Broad commu broader community. And then um, you might have seen the announcement that Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern, there's a Sakai camp report. It's going to be informal and plenty of time for questions, uh, we hope. And that's Tricia and Laura Geckler and myself, and mostly them. And um, let's see, it feels like there's something else. Uh, what else is there? Who else is on here? Somebody must have an announcement besides me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, Atlas, yes. Louisa, why don't you talk about Atlas? All right, uh, quick announcement. I sent out several emails uh, in the past couple of days. You probably already saw it. Um, so Atlas is uh, application is going on right now. Uh, the deadline is February 26th, which is Monday next week, um, the upcoming Monday. We are also recruiting uh, uh, peer reviewers. Uh, we especially recruiting reviewers who can speak and review applications in Spanish and French because we're expecting a couple of them coming in. Um, so if you go to that link, you can see our uh, application materials. And then if you want to become one of our esteemed peer reviewers, uh, you feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm also put my emails here, uh, louisa.lee at imperio.org. Uh, the applications are coming in right now. Uh, remember the deadline is Monday, February 26. Um, we also have uh, Atlas uh, FAQs linked on the page, but if you have any question regarding the your review process, the application itself, or just in general, feel free to email me. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Louisa. Anybody else have any announcements? And Louisa, can guess, you? Oh, sorry. sorry. I was going to uh, ask. Oh, you did paste your. Thank you. Never mind. I was just not an announcement, but I was going to ask this group if um, I've been thinking maybe we should uh, once a month have a Jirapalooza scheduled rather than just um, intermittently. So I was looking for a little feedback on that. And I was thinking maybe we could have a Google Doc or an Etherpad that's like just up all the time that people, when they think of it, they could just paste their Jira issue in there that they would like the community to review so it doesn't become as much of a scramble when we meet to hit the issues most important to the community. Looks like folks are on board with that um, so far, Neil. Okay. So um, just since we're talking about it, the next open date is March 21st. So do we want to go ahead and plan on that? 
We could, or, you know, I guess the other part of the feedback was, do you want it to take up a teaching and learning call, or do you want it to be like a separate meeting? So we still have two teaching and learning calls and one Jirapalooza per month, or did you want it to be like one of the meetings every month is a Jirapalooza? I guess that would be my other question. Oh. Yeah. Well, if it was going to take, uh, uh, sorry, if it was going, if we are going, if we decide to use a teaching and learning call, then the, the JIRA should be teaching and learning focused. Would be my only yeah. recommendation. Yeah, I think that's the intention is that it's for teaching and learning. I just didn't know if we wanted to use up, you know, one meeting a month on, on it. It might not, it might be worth worth it, you know, but I, I was just putting that out there. Yeah, I was I was thinking definitely teaching and learning, not just another JIRA triage, because we already have JIRA triage on Monday afternoons. We've got a special one for Sam and Go on Fridays. So we've got a lot of good JIRA triage going on. So it would be specifically issues that um, people are requesting the teaching and learning group to to review. So maybe we could pull this group, uh, do a plus one in the chat if you like the idea of having a Jira Palooza once a month as one of the teaching and learning calls. Or a minus one if you don't like that idea in the chat. So I, I know there are more than four people on this call, so I'm asking you to give your input. Thank you. So it looks like the eyes have it. <laughs> Charles. <laughs> there was one uh, minus one for Matt Burgess, though. I'm just curious. Oh, I'm sorry. What, uh, okay. Matt. Matt, you want to talk about that? Your vote? It doesn't look like Matt has his microphone enabled. And Charles, you have a point five. Any comments from you about your vote? Just I wasn't quite sure about the frequency, <clears throat> whether once a month was maybe too many, but. Right. It does seem, yeah. Because <clears throat> since we only do two times, we only meet two times a week, that would be kind of half our meetings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's why I also suggested the al alternative of just uh, once a month, but that would be like a third teaching and learning meeting, right, a month. Yeah. One is Jirapalooza and the other two are for <laughs> other topics, but I'm whatever the group wants. I'm not interested in adding more meetings. <laughs> Sorry, personally. Okay. okay. That's my my feelings about that. Okay. And it looks like Terry go lightly. Yeah, every third meeting or every other month. It's better than that. Would either of those would be better than than what we do now, which is n infrequently. So looks like we, you know, maybe not as frequently as as once a month, but um, every third or fourth meeting sounds good. Says Matt, and others seem to be leaning that way as well. So why don't we say every other month for now? And and if we if there are burning topics that we need to talk about, we can always do that. Okay, great. Let's go make a note. And so uh, we facilitators will have to be careful to make sure we get that on the, our schedule and don't overbook it. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody. Um, and thank you, Neil, for that suggestion. So we are at the most exciting part of our um, talk today, and that is hearing from Louisa Lee and Julian Sharp at Marist and Julie, Julie Tengen at Duke University. 
um, going local with global in innovations um, with Atlas. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Tricia. Um, <clears throat> Big Blue Button is telling me I'm presenter, but I, I don't believe it. I haven't had to go through any, um, jump through any hoops yet, but I'm going to try to go to my presentation and go into presenter mode and yeah. see if you um, see it. Julie, yeah. I think it, there's the presenter, uh, there's a uh, share screen Open button. Screen or share? Yeah. You can do screen okay. share or you can do oh, okay. a upload. Right. There it is. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, when you do that, I can introduce the session okay. very quickly. Um, so um, probably some of you have known me as the chair of Atlas Committee. Uh, I've been in this position for almost uh, three years. This is my last year on the seat. Um, so I'm very glad to present a session uh, today. Uh, we're going local with global innovations. Uh, from uh, Atlas. In, in the past the years, actually since 2008, the Atlas used to be called Twisia, uh, has been helping the community uh, with uh, all kinds of innovation in teaching and learning. Uh, we have uh, uh, firstly, uh, primarily focused on Sakai. Um, and then in the past a couple of years, we have introduced a few more new tools in the Perio community, for example, Xerti, uh, OpenCast, and uh, Agruda, uh, a portfolio tool. So uh, we have noticed uh, one uh, phenomenon is that we have individual faculties coming on board to present their innovations. Uh, however, we haven't seen the uh, ripple effect of those uh, innovations in local institutions, um, you know, could be the local institution of the winner of the Atlas Award or the other local institution. It seems like everything is a little bit sporadic. Um, so we're hoping that there could be some ways to uh, bring the Atlas to local institutions and uh, uh, bring uh, more faculty involved uh, in this innovation process and see if we can uh, create more local ripples and see, uh, you know, create more uh, change on campus. Um, so in the community, we have two examples to show you today. Uh, one is from uh, my institution, Marist College. We've been running this uh, um, award for two years now, and this is the third year. And Jolie Tingen from Duke University, they've been very big on Atlas. They're doing Atlas-related events every year. And that's another uh, very interesting uh, case using Atlas uh, as, uh, as a guiding principle. So I will bring um, uh, the microphone to, i pass on the microphone to Jolie. And it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Louisa. Um, I just have this introductory slide and Louisa just went through all of that. Um, <clears throat> we have had a lot of success promoting Atlas at Duke. Um, we've had a couple of people who are winners and that always helps when you can go back and say, hey, look what, what your colleagues have done. But um, I think just anytime we think about um, how, do you get, how do you get word out to faculty? Um, regardless of what the event is. I, since I've been in this field, I've had so many conversations about how do you get faculty to come to your workshops? Um, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a common uh, topic of, of getting faculty's attention about something. Um, and we usually start just by e just the basic thing of when we have our staff meetings, um, we bring up Atlas, we talk about it then, um, we talk about remind all of our instructional designers um, what the process is um, and encourage them to reach out to specific people. Hey, if you've worked with someone who, um, you, who already has a great design that you think would be eligible, um, that would apply for this or that you can work with to tweak theirs, um, you know, reach out to them. So in lots of ways, 
you know, it's what, what we already do as part of our process to um, get faculty's attention over a wide range of things, and Atlas is no exception. Um, another thing that we do is we focus on our already in place process of um, on our website, we have, we blog. Um, so when Atlas is coming up, we, we do a blog post and we have a process that automatically tweets out that blog post. So that's very nice to have that process in place because then you get not only the blog post but the tweet um, that hopefully someone will see um, and also part of our process is we have a monthly newsletter and in that newsletter it culminates the blog posts from the previous month so atlas would be one of the one of the topics in our newsletter um, if we blogged about it recently and um, so that's just yet another avenue for us to communicate with people as part of our regular process. I think one of the most effective things that I've started, started doing in the past few years is highlighting it in message of the day in Sakai. I use my meager design skills to grab an image and put some text on it and put it in message of the day for a week or so. Um, and sometimes we'll, we'll come back to it. We have a lot of things that go in this space because it does get a lot of eyes. Um, but I think that that is where we have gotten the most traction in terms of visibility and getting faculty's attention um, is when we've made that change. Um, and this is you know, the, the image that I used this year and the text that I used. But I think that that has been really, really effective. And we're talking about you know, what you normally do and I think this is probably, I'm gonna talk about an event we did last fall and this kind of got Louise's attention because I shared this with her, my plan about doing this in the fall. Um, in the fall, our group, which used to be called Center for Instructional Technology is called learning, now called Learning Innovation. Um, in years past, probably for a decade or more, has, have had a one day event. It's called, what used to be called the showcase event where we brought in a guest speaker and we had workshops and you know all kinds of you know one day learning technology events um, teaching and learning all kinds of um, events in a single day and um, food and all that and, and every year we were having this conversation about should we keep doing this event you know the numbers are kind of dropping off is it still effective and then this year we finally did something about it we made a change instead of having our one day event we did a month long series of event called Next Steadfast. And that was, you know, not only to test out sort of a new strategy to, uh, as a replacement to our one day showcase, but also to get the word out about our name change. We changed our name to Learning Innovation. And the fact that two departments that had worked kind of together very, uh, in a very integrated way, Online Duke and then the Center for Instructional Technology had become one department officially. And so this is, you know, we had 30 events. It was a crazy month. Um, and one of the ideas that I came up with for our group was to do a, um, do a session called Designing an Award-Winning Course in Sakai. So these are just some of the slides that shows that, that we changed our name and the traditional things that we do when we um, uh, have an event, we have a, a hashtag and a, and a link. Um, but here's the, the first slide for designing an award-winning course. My idea was that it was October, there was still time to kind of start talking about this and actually get faculty thinking about it before the award was announced. And that I would do the, um, it was only a 30 minute session and I would do it as a think, pair, share. Um, session and and I'll talk about that in a minute if you're not familiar with I think pair share because I actually go through it in the slides these are the slides that I used um, so you know the the it was twofold really it was to you know to talk about the award and to make it um, visible to faculty and talk to talk specifically about what it was um, and to also give them a rubric in their hands that they could just continue to ha have and use I took our our Atlas rubric and I stripped out the application part and just did the rubric piece and added some things at the end um, that were links to um, Denise Comer and um, another one of our award recipients, links to their presentations. 
um, that are out there in the community so that they could see those. Um, and I, I wanted to specifically talk about this piece, which I think is really important for Atlas, is what is innovative? Uh, this word innovative kind of scares people off. They think, oh yeah, well, I've got this successful course and I've just redesigned it recently and I think my I think it's really effective. I think students are, are doing really well, but it's not innovative. Um, and so to, to talk about the Atlas definition of innovation, I think is really important. Um, and that is that, you know, what you're doing doesn't have to be new in the world. Um, it just maybe maybe it's something that's new to your discipline or new to you. And it all it has to do is create a transformative learning experience. Um, and I think that's really important to, to frame those kind of conversations about what innovative teaching is and how they should be thinking about what they're doing. Um, and then I, I, I explain what Think Pair Share is. Um, I'll go through it here. What the goal was for us to um, take the rubric cr criteria. We didn't have time to do all of the uh, criteria because it's a, it's a pretty long list. We took took I think maybe just the first three, and we spend two minutes working on um, just reviewing what that criterion is. Then you work with a partner and you you spend two minutes sharing your ideas with a partner about how you might redesign your course to meet the excellent criteria uh, criterion for that specific uh, criterion. And then the last minute, um, I stop everyone and I say, okay, we're going to take a minute to share and I one, one minute to share an idea with from each group with the room. And so, you know, we went through this with the student, the student engagement and community building. Um, then we went through it with communication and then um, learning materials and strategies. And that's the process. Um, I think it was really successful. Um, I think that uh, I've heard some really great ideas from faculty and I think I did this session maybe three or four times um, over the course of a month. Um, and to me, I think what, what was most important Important is promoting the award in advance, um, having a chance to talk about what innovative means, and getting the rubric in the hands of people early on so they can be thinking about this. Um, I think that even if they don't apply for the award, if they have this rubric that they can start using to think about how they're using Sakai um, and what they might do differently, and then hopefully that springs conversations that come to our center when they come and talk to their um, instructional designer that, that is assigned to their, their discipline um, about how they might improve their course. They have something in their hand to think about already. Um, and this is just like how I ended my slide deck, um, just with some more information about Atlas and when, when the application would be available and um, that it's, applicable to course project or ePortfolio because we are we're not using ePortfolios here um, for through Sakai. We're not using Karuta yet. Um, but um, I put that out there just in case someone is using uh, Sakai or a combination of tools that would qualify for an ePortfolio. And just that we're here to help and you know faculty have questions that we partner with them to help them get their application ready, because I think that application can seem overwhelming to people. Um, so we always make sure that when we promote this, that we're, we're more than happy to meet with people to help them um, get their application ready and talk to them about their course. Jolie, this is Trisha. Can I ask you a quick question? Of course, I'm done. So now oh, okay. time for questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, um, how much time do you think you commit to when you're helping someone with um, completing the application and um, you know getting their course site ready and all of that um, how much time do you all spend for a given instructor in that process I'm gonna say a f three hours. Um, now I say that because I'm in my experience working with 
Hyann, when she was working with Jenny Degagne and, and nursing to get her application ready, um, that it may not be fully accurate. That's kind of just what I remember mm -hmm. working on it. Um, and, and Denise Comer, although she was said she was going to work with our consultant, Randy Riddle, um, he, I don't think she did. <laughs> okay. I think she ended up just doing it on her own. Um, so it varies I and mean, it depends on the faculty. Um, but I think Hyann spent quite a bit of time working with Jenny on her application. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't, since I, I was on the committee, so I wasn't working with people on their applications. Um, and so that's just sort of what I remember. But I can confirm with Hyann and, and let you know. Yeah. Looks what like the investment Louisa, was on her part. Louisa is indicating in chat that she concurs with that approximate time commitment. Yeah. That of course it will vary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's helpful. Great. So um, this is just my contact information. If you want to know anything about you know what we do in terms of um, what our process is for promoting Atlas or any anything to um, to faculty and our, the link to our site because that's where our blog posts are and you can kind of see what we do and of course I'm on a Perio Slack if anyone. Um, wants to reach out to me there if you're on Slack, that's perfect. So, thank you. Shall you're welcome. So, Louisa or Julian, do I need to give one of you presenter privileges? Uh, yes, please give to Julian. Okay. I have Look, just. There? I've just done that. Um, yep, I'm here. Perfect. So, Julian, you'll need to share your desktop, probably. Or you can upload your PowerPoint. Right. So. There's a, a on the lower left side, there's a little button. That's an up, upload lower button. Lower left side. Or lower right. I don't know. My, mm -hmm. my screen is different. Do you see anything that invites yeah, you it's asking me to it's asking me to update my content to be able to share. So where is the ability to upload Louisa? Maybe that'll be easier versus sharing. Um, if you look on the presentation panel, the 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 center panel. Mm -hmm. um, would be at the, oh, the upload button. button. Yeah. And I believe it needs to be in PDF format. Oh, not PowerPoint? Neil, does it convert it to PDF automatically? Oh. oh. Ta -da. Oh, wait. That's saying that it's a template. That's weird. That's not it. Oh, that's not it. Let's try something different. And that does appear to be a PowerPoint. That's weird. Let's try this again. Yep, there we go. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, Luis asked me to talk a little bit about what we do at Marist to promote the Atlas Awards. And we do a, things a little bit differently than what Duke does. Um, I want to give you a little bit of our historical context. They started the Teaching with iLearn, which is what we've branded Sakai um, Innovation Awards in the 2015-16 academic year, and we added a faculty incentive to it. So we give faculty a $1,500 conference reimbursement to travel to an educational technology conference should they win our Marist Teaching with iLearn Innovation Awards. Um, so it gives them incentive to take a look at things and apply. 
our history for year one, and Louisa can correct me if I'm wrong on these because she was at Maris at the time and I'm relatively new, um, four full-time faculty applied and two full-time faculty participated as reviewers. Three were actually invited, but one never um, fulfilled any review items. Um, in the second year, four full-time faculty applied, two adjuncts applied, and we also had four full-time faculty who participated as reviewers. Um, so as it's gone, it's generated some interest in taking a look at the Atlas rubric, really kind of tailoring their courses to that Atlas rubric. And then um, what we do is then we encourage those people who have applied for the um, Marist Award to then go and apply for the Atlas Award. And I believe one of our instructors has won an honorable mention um, in previous years. So we do use the Atlas rubric to assess our applicants and um, we encourage our winners to apply for Atlas. Um, for the 2017-18 year, we decided to kind of change things up a little bit and redesign. We launched what we're calling Tech Ideas, which is Technology, Innovation, and Digital Education Awards. And what we found was that when we limited our award to only courses, we were um, we were kind of segregating our campus because a lot of people use Sakai for things that are different than just a course. So, um, for example, the Marist poll uses our, our iLearn to train their students on how to do survey polling. Um, and some of our other organizations on campus use it for clubs and a variety of things. So one of our two awards this year will be presented for excellence in digital course design, which will use the Atlas rubric to evaluate all of the entries and it will use the Atlas rubric as it exists now. Um, and our other award will be presented for the innovative use of technology, which could also be won um, by any staff who's using Sakai. And we modified the Atlas rubric a little bit because um, some of the applicants who will be applying for that Innovative Use of Technology Award are, like I said, using it not for a course. They're using it for something different. But we wanted to be able to recognize those people as well. And so we'll be encouraging those who apply to the Innovative Use of Technology and the Excellence in Digital Course Design Awards to apply for the Atlas Awards through Perio. Our goal is to give faculty the tools to create great courses and to provide an incentive for faculty to align to Atlas. Faculty tend to like to travel to conferences and our goal is that if we can get them to use digital resources and apply to an award like this and I can give them a travel reimbursement to go to you know our open aperio conference or another conference that's similar that they can learn about more technology-based education practices um, we'll start to have almost a grassroots movement of an innovative culture um, on our campus. So our goal is to use those um, faculty members who are great contributors and who really have a love for technology to kind of permeate throughout our campus. And that's all I've got. <laughs> Sorry if I spoke too fast. Um, um, and I didn't include a slide like Jolie did with my contact information, but like Jolie, I am in the Aperio Slack channel and you can email me and I'll stick my email here in the chat. There you go. Wonderful. Thank you, Julin. Sure. So it, it was one of my questions how schools, um, if schools reimbursed faculty for their travel. And so it sounds like you guys go ahead and do that, uh, which I'm sure is a great incentive. Yes, yeah, so for those that win this award, we do reimburse them for their travel to, um, to various 
they have a list of educational technology conferences that the travel reimbursement is is good for. So they have like a, a list of eligible conferences that they can use it for. Oh, okay. So Open Imperio is not the exclusive. It's not. It's not exclusive, but that's the one that the majority of them use it for. It's the one that we push right. them toward. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> encourage them yes <laughs> i can't go into it going this is the only thing you can go to right. um, however we can strongly encourage them to go a certain way great any other questions from the um attendees can i add something about the faculty incentives or uh, this is louisa absolutely yes um so i think the huge incentive is the uh, conference reimbursement. Uh, besides that, we also use this opportunity to scout the great in innovative teaching and learning among faculty. Mm -hmm. So um, if they apply or if they won or uh, they became the winner, the first uh, uh, prize or the honorable mentions, uh, we invite them to come back to do a faculty showcase. Um, so uh, it, it's very interesting how they uh, all very gladly uh, agree to do it. So it's an um, opportunity for them to share their teaching and learning uh, innovations with the whole campus. Mm -hmm. And we also have this, uh, 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 this, uh, this uh, I wouldn't say model, so it, this idea that we bring this to their home. So we schedule it in their own building so their own department can come and participate. Um, so they seem to like that a lot. And one of them, the department even um, uh, agreed to pay for all the catering, everything without even um, asking us. So they say, hey, we pay for everything, you come along. Mm -hmm. and I feel that the, uh, the full-time faculty uh, especially the uh, tenure track faculty really welcome it because it's uh, adding something to their list of achievement. And also adjunct faculty, uh, they want to build up their resume. They want to find a better job, to even become full time. So they also welcome it. So mm -hmm. we, we feel that these two types of incentives are uh, working uh, really well at the moment. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a, a few questions here in the chat. Uh, Jennifer is asking a technical question. Does Duke or Marist have faculty who use additional um, cascading style sheets or HTML coding besides the default in their lessons to make the content more dynamic? You guys know? Sure. Um, Julian, can I answer this? Go ahead. Sure. Uh, at a moment, we don't have a faculty using additional CSS or HTML coding. Uh, even the computer science department, those faculties, uh, they don't use uh, CSS coding either. Um, they find the lessons, the template is fluid or flexible enough to accommodate most of their needs. Um, I, I guess we also ask them to focus on the uh, teaching, the pedagogy side. We didn't push anything on the coding side, the technical side. Right. Yeah. So that, that simplified their, um, you know, any barriers to them doing this, I imagine. Yeah, exactly. And, and Jolie um, chatted that they are not, um, their faculty are not using additional CSS or HTML either. So good to know, good to know. And, and Folks from both of your faculty from both of your schools have won Atlas Awards, so that's 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 nice that the barrier is you know keep the barriers as low as possible. Um, another question from Terry Go Lightly. She's asking, how do you find the conversation among teachers and or developers who may not be actively pursuing the award? And I'm guessing you mean if they know about it but they're not actively pursuing it. Terry, is that Maybe you want to come on your mic and clarify. Yeah, that goes with the next part of the question. 
Um, do you find that they're elevating their own game? Do they seem motivated towards self-improvement or indifferent to the whole thing? Is it, I guess this is directing it towards the idea of the whole culture is, are the, the awards and the process and the conversation out there, is that a rising tide floats all boats and that kind of thing? Are things improving generally? Are people motivated to do it, even if they're not going for the award? Sure, I, I can speak to that a little bit from what I see at Marist. I, I think that in, in a culture of faculty, when you're talking about like a, a grassroots type movement, um, it, you, you always have the ones that are the holdouts. Um, right. But for the most part, what I see with our Marist faculty is that the majority of our faculty want to provide good courses and they want to give their students the tools that they need to be successful. So if there's a way for them to do that, they're interested in learning about it, trying things out. Um, and as Louisa said, it, they like to learn from their colleagues. So doing the faculty showcases allows our, our faculty members to learn from each other. So instead of Louisa or me or a member of our team standing up there and saying, you know, this is how you should integrate digital learning content into your class, to have a have a colleague, a, another faculty member teach them about that really kind of encourages them to think outside the box. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, speaking um, at, for Duke, um, we have a we have a lot of incentives for faculty as well. Um, our, again, faculty are not a homogenous group, um, but we do have quite a few number of faculty who are um, interested in improving their course and their teaching. And we have um, our course design institute that we offer and our faculty fellows program, and those are offered annually. And there is a stipend related to that, um, so there is monetary incentive for faculty to participate in those but faculty who are here i mean it's a it's a time intensive thing they, they want to do it um, and then we also have grants that we offer on an ongoing basis to faculty for for different things that they want to do to improve their course and we have jumpstart grants and, and other programs and all that info is on our website if you want to take a look at that thank you sounds wonderful um, Jolie, I have a question for you about your shift from a from a day long event to a, a month long um, series of events. And <laughs> <laughs> see, I thought you might. <laughs> I'm very curious. I don't know if is the past year the first time that you all have done that, and uh, what was the experience like, and do you recommend it? You know, it was a great experience. Um, we spent less money and reached more people. So that was great. Yeah. Um, so that we consider that to be a win. And, and we, you know, we were able to do some assessment around it. And so we surveyed people and, and found out um, some ways we can refine, refine it again. But we probably are going to do it again, but with some changes mm -hmm. based on feedback that we received. We felt, we thought it was pretty successful. One of, the, one of the things that we did is we partnered with other groups on campus through, with our programming. Um, and that's actually one of our new goals um, with our new organizational structure. And so we kind of have some new goals related to that. And so we're really focusing on partnerships throughout campus and with an emphasis more on, you know, we've always been sort of a teaching shop, right? We focus on faculty and teaching. And the shift to learning kind of opens up new partnerships on campus for people that we might work with um, that, that, you know, are focused on providing learning opportunities. Yeah. I can imagine that you would certainly, uh, the opportunities for people to come to one or more of these events is, you know, just opened up because of the um, extended time frame and the focus for an entire month. Right. So uh, that's a really interesting idea, and I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> and the partnerships, of course. I, I, I can't imagine pulling it off without 
you know, doing it in partnership with other groups. For sure. Yeah, that was uh, pretty critical to the success of it, I think. Thank you. Other comments or thoughts or questions? Um, I'm going to make another comment. Um, so um, as the Athos chair for a few years, I noticed that uh, uh, to reach out um, to all the faculty and the uh, those people who work in the front line of teaching and learning, uh, the Twitter or the announcement actually are uh, not the most effective communications uh, to reach them. We definitely have to have some type of a local representation. Uh, so, for example, uh, Duke, they send out blogs, they send out tweets. Uh, those actually reach out to their local uh, faculty. Uh, so it's really important that um, one of the uh, APERA members, uh, and they could uh, have this type of steady uh, support of Atlas or Apero uh, teaching and learning innovations uh, on their uh, in their local institution. You know, set up some uh, uh, steady support system and work with the faculties to bring them to the global community. So my title is uh, I try to be funny. So I said uh, local uh, innovations, uh, but eventually those local innovations will go global. You know, circle is going back and forth, and uh, I hope that this could, uh, uh, this presentation could give you guys uh, some ideas. You know, what may happen, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we welcome more people to join the big Atlas family. Uh, we have representation in many institutions now. Uh, I hope that we could get more. And by the way. Um, we are uh, actively seeking the next Atlas chair. So please nominate yourself. <laughs> All right, join the Atlas big family. Thank you guys. It's my last comment. Thank you, Louisa. And, and truly thank you from all of us, I think in the Sakai community and Aperio for your dedication and service on this, on this committee. Um, you have really done a fantastic job as chair. So thank you. And Neil nominates everyone on this call <laughs> to be the next chair. Very good. <laughs> oh, thank you guys so much. That was wonderful. And oh my gosh, I have so many ideas going around in my head now, um, as I'm sure others on the call do. Um, and, and uh, so I, I'm hopeful that these conversations can continue at Open Aperio, um, as I'm sure they will. So um, thank you again for presenting today. It was great. Uh, so we uh, will wrap up now. I want to remind folks that the next meeting is on March 7th and Charles Bristow from Illinois State is going to um, present on functional issues with Gradebook NG. And Charles, you may or may not have a, a co-presenter. I believe you you were thinking of that. Is that right? Sorry, I had to get my mic turned on. Um, yeah, I might rope Ben into um, co-presenting. I'm not sure if he's still on the call. No, it looks like he yeah, left. Looks like he's already dropped off. So awesome. Um, well, we're looking forward to that. And then we will do a Jira Palooza on the 21st of March. So we have all of April and beyond open for um, other topics. I hope folks on the call will reach out to me or Neil or Matt Burgess um, and let us know if you have a topic you want to share on an upcoming call. We're very much interested in hearing from you. Does anyone have any final announcements to make before we adjourn? All right. 
Well, we're going to um, be able to adjourn a little early today then. I want to thank our presenters, Jolie Tengen from Duke, Julian Sharp, and Louisa Lee from Marist for this really interesting and um, thought-provoking presentation and uh, all the others on the call for attending today. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.